impacts on federal Indian law here in the United States. Um, as a uh, practitioner of federal Indian law since uh, 1973, uh, I am really more excited now uh, than I have ever been in my career 
about the positive impacts of international law upon our federal Indian law here in the United States. And um, I'm, I have very good reason for that, and that is this landmark uh, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that was approved by the UN in the year 2007. This is uh, an absolutely landmark international declaration that affects each and every Indian tribe and tribal community and Native American and Alaska Native community here in the United States. And I, I simply, uh, I have to say at the outset that I, I do, I stand in awe here of the giants um, in the field of international law and indigenous rights uh, who have been assembled here at this conference. And, uh, you know, I, I just uh, deeply admire uh, the work of visionary leaders uh, such as uh, Tim Coulter, um, Julian Berger, uh, who for their uh, you know groundbreaking work you know on this UN declaration, um, uh, you you all are absolutely heroes in my book you know for for your uh, uh, being a pioneer and making the UN accountable to Native people you know and, and I, I just I want to salute you, uh, commend you, and. and Thank you for your efforts, you know, in this landmark uh, UN declaration. Uh, Professor uh, Re Rebecca Sosi from ASU, uh, it's so nice to see you. She is uh, one of our leading uh, legal experts in, in the area of cultural rights, you know, of Native people here in the United States. And I've long valued my uh, uh, privilege to work with you over the years. And um, I'm a little bit disappointed that uh, uh, Brian Newland didn't make it, you know, as the policy a policy advisor to Assistant Secretary of the Interior, Larry Echohawk, because uh, uh, it just seems to me that uh, uh, they have a role to play now in helping to implement this UN declaration here in the United States. You know, the Interior Department is our trustee. And uh, they need to weigh in in a major way here with the State Department and the Obama administration to get the U U.S. to change its stance, which was to oppose the uh, declaration, you know, and to, to uh, provide leadership uh, uh, within the Obama administration, you know, to, to uh, embrace this declaration and begin the process of implementing it along with the rest of the world. Um, but I just wanted to say that I really do, Tim, you know, I bow to you and, and uh, Mr. Berger, you know, for your wonderful, wonderful work on behalf of all indigenous peoples. Um, I think that this conference is very timely uh, for a number of reasons um, to, to look at the impact of international law on uh, federal Indian law and our tribal state relations uh, for two reasons that spring to my mind. Uh, first, the first reason uh, to really take a hard look at international law, and particularly this declaration, is that our domestic law, that is our the federal Indian law, is in trouble right now. Uh, it's under severe attack by the U.S. Supreme Court and it needs a lifeline, I think, to be thrown to it. Uh, uh, most of us practitioners in federal Indian law and uh, tri uh, tribal, the tribal leaders that are here tonight, as well as the scholars, you know, in, in, in the field of federal Indian law, are acutely aware of the devastating trend of the U.S. Supreme Court under the, since 1985 in the Rehnquist Court and also in the Roberts Court to uh, rule against Indian tribes in, in very important cases that come before that court. Um, and we've experienced a loss record in that court uh, since 1985 of over 80% of our cases are lost in the U.S. Supreme Court. Prison inmates fare better in that court than Indian nations. And it's a very troubling state of affairs that has uh, caused many of our tribal leaders and, and uh, worried uh, legal scholars to ask, you know, 
is federal Indian law dead? Or what does remain of federal Indian law uh, as envisioned by John Marshall in the Worcester case? Um, and so one forum that uh, um, tribal, you know, when one forum turns sours, in this instance the U.S. Supreme Court, practitioners in federal Indian law have to explore other forums for possible relief, be it in the Congress or in the administrative branch, executive branch, uh, um, or when they all are anti-Indian, which happens from time to time, uh, then we have to look elsewhere, and perhaps internationally, to international forums or to international law. And so my question, or that I would propose, uh, or premise here is to propose that uh, international law uh, can provide a source for strengthening federal Indian law in, in the 21st century. Um, international law has always influenced federal Indian law from the very beginning of federal Indian law in our country here. And examples of that in, in uh, the legal doctrines and principles of federal Indian law abound. Uh, they're seen in the Indian Trust Doctrine, uh, which uh, derived its guardianship principle from Victoria's Law of Nations, uh, which uh, John Marshall in, incorporated in pretty much whole cloth uh, into our domestic <coughs> law in the Cherokee Nation and, and Worcester decision. We see it in the doctrine of discovery, this infamous and odious uh, doctrine, you know, that uh, uh, began with the Popol Bull, you know, uh, that uh, conveyed the hemisphere to Spain in, in 1493. This doctrine was incorporated into U.S. Uh, uh, law in the Johnson v. McIntosh case, which Professor Robertson is very familiar with having in his groundbreaking book. Um, the doctrine of discovery, also utilized in, in the uh, uh, Johnson v. McIntosh and cases in the modern uh, day cases such as the Tihatan decision in 1954. Um, the use of treaties, the wide use of treaties springs from international law and practice. Much of our federal Indian law is based upon treaties. Um, so Indian law is heavily influenced by international law. Um, the, basically the law of colonialism, the early law of colonialism of Europe uh, formed uh, these international <coughs> rules for the colonization and conquest of the new world. Um, and it had this, these attendant mindsets of colonialism with the attendant uh, racism and cultural and racial religious superiority of the Europeans over the peoples of the new world um, were sort of embedded into uh, federal Indian law early on and that worked their way into many of our foundational principles. So <coughs> international law has been an important source of federal Indian law in early days, but it can also be a positive influence uh, on our law in the 21st century as well, as contemporary uh, Indian law. Um, the early days, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the courts very fervently uh, relied heavily on, on concepts of international law to dispossess Native America and to subjugate uh, the tribes and to rule the tribes with uh, concepts of guardianship and plenary power. This was all uh, 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 came from international law to, and also to justify uh, the uh, manifest destiny, you know, um, and make everything uh, in that history perfectly legal. <coughs> um, but we can use international law as well to do good. And I think that, that this was recognized by the Australian High Court in 1992 in the Mabo decision, uh, which overturned uh, unjust legal doctrines and unjust legal fictions in Australia 
for appropriating uh, Aboriginal land title, uh, which was a uh, skeletal uh, principle upon which all of Australian land titles are based upon, uh, were overturned in 1992 in the, in the historic Mabo decision. Um, and the court in that case, in, in that landmark case, relied in part upon contemporary international law to uplift the indigenous land rights stating that contemporary international law, and I'm going to quote here, is a legitimate and important influence on the development of common law, especially when international law declares the existence of universal human rights, unquote. So in, uh, international law might serve to resuscitate, I think, our federal Indian law, which has been under assault by the Supreme Court in recent decades, especially where it, uh, it does articulate universal notions of human rights. And of course, that's precisely what this UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples does. Um, and I think that if our nation uh, and the courts of our nation and our legal system and policy makers were to embrace uh, the principles and standards in this UN declaration as fervently as uh, they did embrace international law in the early days of our republic, we will witness a sea change in the way that our society and our nation and our legal system views indigenous peoples here in, in the United States. <clears throat> so I think it is timely to take a hard look at international law as we chart the course for, for the future here in our own nation, our, uh, you tribal leaders here and you practitioners of Indian law as well as scholars uh, to, to take a hard look at this declaration and, you, and, and international law to see how that could influence our, our own quest here in our own land to strengthen uh, the, the law that it pertains to Native people in the ne this next generation to root out some of the weaknesses found in federal Indian law that render our sovereignty vulnerable. Um, the second reason I think that makes this conference very timely is uh, is the fact that the implementation of this UN declaration is at hand. All of the other nations across the planet are in the process of implementing this UN declaration. And we need to get on board to do the same thing in our own, in our own land here. The UN declaration, as the experts that are here will tell you, is not a self-implementing document. It has to be ad 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 adopted by each nation and implemented by each nation through, through legislative or other steps that have to be taken. And the other nations in the world um, are in the process of actually doing that. <clears throat> and um, uh, of course, that's a major, major challenge for indigenous peoples and all of these other nations across the world that have indigenous people, and I'm talking about maybe 72 nations uh, that have about over 350 million indigenous peoples, you know, that are uh, looking at this, uh, these minimum standards and how, how they would uh, apply in these nations. And it raises in our own land some very sobering social and political challenges um, as the, uh, uh, one adage in our profession is it's easy to get a law passed, but it's really hard as hell to implement it, you know. And even though the declaration, you know, took, took 20 years in the making and, and a lot of uh, uh, sweat and tears went into the making of that, the implementation of, of, of that UN declaration across the world and in our own land will become the work of a generation or two, I think, and it informs the agenda for this and the next generation, I think. 
um, and I, um, I think that it's going to require a social movement by a committed race of indigenous Americans to, to uh, get that UN declaration adapted, adopted by the U.S. and implemented in the U.S. Uh, similar to that same kind of a social movement that uh, the black Americans had in the uh, civil rights movement that uh, uh, propelled the, uh, by the NAAC Defense Fund, which had a comprehensive social and litigation strategy that led to Brown v. Board of Education that overturned uh, racial segregation in America. That case was not an isolated incident but it was the product of a focused social movement. And we need to bring to bear that kind of effort, that kind of priority in our own land to implement this declaration here in the United States. So um, currently uh, the U.S. was only one of four nations that voted against this U.N. declaration. The rest of the world voted in favor of it, except for the U.S., Canada, New Zealand and Australia, four of the hardcore settler states, you know, that uh, voted against this uh, declaration. Even the even the traditional European colonization powers of Europe, you know, voted in favor of this document. But the last four holdouts were the U.S., Canada, Australia, and and New Zealand. So right now. Um, um, uh, there are a number of things happening in, in our, our country that shows us that the train is leaving the station here uh, and uh, as far as the uh, declaration is concerned. First of all, the Obama administration, uh, as part of its campaign promise to Indian country, promised to review, have the State Department review its opposition against the uh, declaration. The Bush uh, State Department vote, voted against this declaration for reasons of its own. I don't know, perhaps Tim would enlighten us on that, but uh, 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 the Obama administration is now in the process of reviewing that stance in consultation with Indian tribes, and we need to get uh, activated and get the tribal governments uh, activated in their legal counsel to get our uh, uh, consultation in on that to explain to the, the Obama Justice Department that this is a good thing, that it comports well with our fundamental Indian self-determination and economic self-government and our self-government uh, policies and, and, uh, and needs to be embraced by the United States and not opposed. Um, Secondly, uh, and, and uh, some of the uh, practitioners here may have more up-to-date information, but uh, Congress is currently considering H.R. Uh, 50, uh, 1551 uh, that was introduced into Congress this last July by uh, Eni Falamagaweva, uh, a uh, delegate, non-voting member of Congress, a delegate, delegate from the uh, American Samoa, they have delegates to Congress. I think tribes ought to have them as well. They're non-voting members that can introduce bills, do every, um, participate in committee uh, deliberations, do everything but vote on a measure. But uh, any fellow of Guayba who's been a longtime champion of, of Indian country, he's been in the uh, U.S. Uh, Congress, so the House of Representatives for many years, uh, introduced this uh, uh, resolution that would encourage the U.S. to change its stance and to uh, co uh, cooperate, collaborate with Indian country to begin the implementation process. And so that's a pending measure in Congress. I hope it's still alive, but I don't know the, I don't know the legislative status of that. Perhaps someone here does. Um, and then thirdly, uh, we have our tribal leaders and our uh, Indian law scholars and, and our uh, uh, tribal attorneys that are just sort of beginning to study out this UN declaration and begin thinking about uh, the impacts of this uh, historic document on strengthening our legal rights. And I want to talk a little bit about that at home, you know. 
But I think one thing that every, each and every Indian tribe can do is to pass a, a, a tribal law or a tribal resolution embracing this document, establishing a legal precedent or a statutory precedent for the states and for the Congress to, to actually uh, embrace and adopt these uh, policies here. So um, for all of these reasons, I think it's very timely to have this conference tonight. So I commend the law school and uh, uh, Professor Rice, you know, and the others that have put this together for bringing us together on this subject. Uh, what I'd like to do in the time uh, 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 remaining for me is to really touch on three areas here. I'd like to, first of all, uh, just talk a little bit more about the importance of this UN Declaration in my own opinion. Secondly, I'd like to talk a little bit about how I think it affects the future of federal Indian law. And then thirdly, I'd like to uh, do a little exercise with you about reviewing how these standards uh, would have uh, cured basically the dark side of federal Indian law had they been in effect, you know, a uh, hundred years ago when all of these uh, bad cases were handed down that I studied in my book. You know, I probably wouldn't have wrote the book um, had these standards been in place back then. But uh, uh, so let me just turn first uh, to the importance of uh, federal Indian law or the, uh, uh, the UN Declaration, I think, in general. Um, you know, it's just of enormous importance. It's hard to overstate uh, the uh, really uh, life-altering uh, uh, landmark importance of this UN Declaration. It affects indigenous peoples all over the world and each and every Indian tribe here at home. <clears throat> and what it does is it sets minimum standards uh, for each nation to for the dignity and the survival and the well-being of, of, of the world's indigenous peoples. That affects all of us. Um, and I think that uh, this document holds with it great promise to change the world, to literally change the world. It could serve as the Magna Carta for indigenous peoples. It would be the equivalent of uh, uh, Brown v. Board of Education, in my mind, you know, as far as the importance. If this document is implemented, if it's interpreted and not watered down, you know, but it implemented in a strong way, um, it, it could be our Magna Carta and change the way that the world comports itself with the surviving indigenous peoples, these are hunting, fishing, and uh, gathering cosmologies and the way that we look at the land it would fundamentally reorder and restructure the rights and relationships and re responsibilities between uh, indigenous and non-indigenous peoples around the world. So it's a transformative document, it, it really is. And, and, and furthermore, it's landmark in international law because before uh, this declaration was approved in the year 2007, there was virtually nothing in international law for indigenous peoples. International law relegated our indigenous nations strictly to the domestic arena that we would be, our rights would be defined according to the law of the different nations where we lived. And international law would hold no uh, protections for us. And so it was sort of like a loophole I guess, you know, in which uh, our fate was relegated to uh, the fox guarding the hen house because it was often the states that were the worst oppressors of indigenous peoples, but yet international law would cast us to the lot, you know, of, of the various, of the laws and policies of the various states. <clears throat> so um, by articulating these minimum standards then, uh, in this declaration, it's really the first time that, inter that this has bubbled up to the surface of, of the international arena in the form of a declaration. And I would submit that that represents a fundamental change in international law uh, from 
being a tool to dispossess native people and make every the colonization perfectly legal to in fact restoring our human and political and cultural rights. So it's a major shift, it seems to me. And uh, you know, it's, it's going to be hard to overstate the, the uh, social change that this uh, declaration might be able to bring about. Um, I, I do think that uh, if with a lot of hard work over the next generation that uh, that uh, by indigenous peoples and Americans of goodwill in our own land that this would fundamentally restructure uh, the rights, relationships, and responsibilities between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples uh, in the U.S. as well as over 70 other nations uh, affecting the fate of, of all indigenous peoples across the planet. And, um, so having said that, I think that uh, it goes without saying that the implementation of, um, of this uh, UN declaration, which holds such great promise, uh, is critical. I think it's critical to all of us, and I would hope that uh, Indian country would prioritize this uh, work to study out the provisions of this document and uh, work uh, in a strategic way, you know, to develop a strategy for how are we going to implement this document in our own land. <clears throat> what I'd like to spend a few minutes on is, is how this declaration could set the course for the future of federal Indian law. Uh, I had occasion recently to look at that subject in my book, you know, in the courts of the conqueror. Um, and um, Basically, um, which I started writing, which uh, while this was still a draft declaration, uh, had, and it became one of the principal themes in my book, you know, which deals with uh, law reform. You know, identifying the weaknesses in federal Indian law by studying ten really bad cases and trying to find out what are the underlying forces at work in producing these outcomes that uh, are manifestly unjust. Um, but after having written um, 10 chapters on, of complaint, I thought, well, gee, you know, I need to add a chapter here about how to, a blueprint for, you know, reforming federal Indian law. And so I did. And uh, what I came up with was, uh, was that, uh, first of all, there is, uh, I have a premise that we do need to strengthen federal Indian law in the next generation. It's the legal framework that we depend on as native peoples in, in our rise of the modern Indian nations this, that we witnessed during the, the, the modern era of federal Indian law. Federal Indian law was the legal framework that uh, uh, we made our nation building advances through, you know, it acted as a shield to protect Native America during that historic social movement of the last generation or two. Uh, but it has two sides to it. It's got a good side that strengthens us, provides a shield to protect us and our sovereignty, our aspirations as Native people. But it has a dark side as well, you know, that we can see in some of the Supreme Court decisions, you know, that uh, apply uh, nefarious legal doctrines of discovery and some, some uh, notions of racism and uh, colonialism that I think is outdated in a post-colonial world. <clears throat> um, and we see the, that bad side being very easily uh, uh, utilized by the Roberts and the Rehnquist courts whenever they choose to, uh, to pare back on our rights. So um, there is a need to strengthen federal Indian law in this next generation to consolidate the gains that we made in the rise of modern Indian nations and to make sure that the law and the United States is always used as a shield to protect Native America and never again as a sword to harm, bring great harm to our Native people, to strip away our land and sovereignty and political rights and, and human rights as Native people. But I'm optimistic that that can be done. Uh, it'll be the work of the next generation to, uh, to uh, root out once and for all 
uh, the dark side of federal Indian law. First, I think that the Supreme Court is rowing against the tide because um, it's seeking to whittle back on tribal sovereignty at the same time when the other branches of the federal government are trying to bolster tribal sovereignty through this uh, Indian uh, self-determination policy and our economic uh, 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 policies as well, you know, that uh, uh, the Supreme Court is out of step with them. Secondly, I think that our Indian tribes are poised now as never before in the, over the past 150 years to uh, vigorously uh, protect their rights, their legal rights, and to lead and inform a, a movement to strengthen federal Indian law. Uh, this after the rise of modern Indian nations and we see the, uh, uh, these uh, sophisticated tribal governments that across our political landscape and they form the, uh, the uh, social unit, political unit and, uh, and for law reform and the impetus for law reform. Third, I think the tribes have, we, we see increased prosperity among many of our tribes now through the gaming industry, making uh, wealth available, discretionary revenues available that could possibly underwrite this quest for justice in our society. You know, justice costs money, you know, and I think we have that now for the first time in many, many years. Uh, fourth, I think we have a lot more human resources, you know. When I went to law school, uh, I think there were about 12 native attorneys, you know, in the field of federal Indian law. And today, thanks to uh, places like uh, TU Law School and others, you know, we have uh, probably two or 3,000 native attorneys, you know, that are practicing uh, law across the country, as well as professionals in many of the other fields. So I think we're we're poised, you know, to have the human resources to mount a challenge to the dark side of human, of uh, federal Indian law. And finally, we live in a changed world. I, I think that the world has simply changed. Uh, we're no longer an abject colony, or there's uh, people don't really think, or most people don't think Indians are inferior, or our religions are barbaric. And, Many Americans uh, want to see our tribal people's cultures preserved as a good thing, you know. So uh, uh, and it, it just seems to me that colonialism and that mindset and that legal regime has been repudiated internationally as repugnant. And we now have this declaration, which I, I think is going to be the new order of the day. Um, So as far as reforming federal Indian law, uh, I had articulated a, a few goals in my book. Um, the first, uh, centering on this declaration, this UN declaration. I think that the next generation has to elevate our federal Indian law so that it comports with each and every standard that's set forth in that UN declaration. And I think that that will be the work of a generation. There's some pretty tall orders in there, even though our nation probably comes closest to, uh, than most to meeting those standards. You know, there's a, a lot of uh, tall orders of work in there, protecting our intellectual property rights, um, our sacred places, our uh, uh, holy uh, holy ground. You know, uh, there are just a few of the many many challenges that including uh, indigenous habitat, you know, that our hunting, fishing, and gathering cultures still depend upon. Um, so I think that's one goal, is to implement the declaration and uh, elevate all aspects of federal Indian law so it, it comports with these standards. So the document serves as a guidepost for law reformers in the next generation, a legislative and litigation agenda for the next generation. Secondly, I think that, uh, that uh, uh, we should try to steer the Supreme Court back to the Worcester decision of John Marshall in 1833. Uh, the protectorate principle that John Marshall envisioned, also coming from international law as well. You know, he said that our Indian nations through their treaties came into the Union under the protection of the United States. 
and that uh, that this relationship uh, uh, was of a was a protectorate relationship, and he looked directly to international law and international relations of his day to say what that meant, and spent considerable time. So I think we need to. Uh, direct the Supreme Court back to that grand vision of this protectorate relationship, and we ought to be able to flourish as protectorates uh, uh, under the protection of the strongest nation. Um, and I'm running out of time here, but... Uh, <laughs> that was a So uh, let me just, uh, in a couple quick moments then, um, but I think those are the two guiding principles that I would submit as guiding stars for law reformers in the next generation. This declaration and the Worcester decision, along the way I'll overturn a few cases like Johnson v. McIntosh and, and a few others that I missed in my book, um, perhaps <coughs> developing a few new legal theories. Um, for strengthening our cultural sovereignty. Um, but um, I want to just run through these 10 cases real quick by way of closing and show you how my book would never have been written if, this, if these standards were in place. Uh, I looked at 10 cases or 10 areas of the law that I felt were just atrocious uh, and also that the reading public would enjoy, find interesting anyway. Um, the first one is Johnson v. McIntosh, you know, this doctrine of discovery and conquest as the basis for uh, uh, appropriating title to America. Um, that would not have come out in the same way if, if Article 28 of the uh, Declaration was in, in place in, in uh, 1823 when that case was handed down. Article 28 recognizes the land right, legal rights of ownership to land and requires states to protect those rights. Um, and uh, that, with that, in my way I interpret that, it repudiates this discovery doctrine and would cause John Marshall, who wrote that opinion, to roll over in his grave. Cherokee Nation and the legal framework for removal that the uh, Southern Judiciary, the Supreme Courts of Tennessee, Georgia, and Alabama uh, developed the legal framework for removal of the tribes would never have occurred. Uh, it flew, would fly in the face of Article 10 of the Declaration, which says no forcible removal. And that would have stopped Georgia in its tracks, and, and it would have uh, stopped and President Andrew Jackson in his tracks as well. Articles 26 and 28 uh, uh, not only recognizes and protects land rights, indigenous land rights, but it requires that it be done in a fair and impartial and independent tribunal, that our courts you know, be fair and open and transparent, something that was sorely lacking in the Johnson proceeding, which was uh, uh, kind of on the seamy side from a judicial and attorney ethics standpoint. Um, and then Article 8, you know, prevents acts of dispossession, which is what this removal movement was all about. Thirdly, I looked at the use of violence in American history. Were the Indian Wars legal? That's what I wanted to explore there which also pertains to the current violence that we have today. Uh, we see in Indian country, which is two or three or four times the national uh, uh, rate of violence, so that we live under a cloud of violence. But Article 7 basically says that indigenous peoples have the right to life, physical and mental integrity, liberty, the right to live in peace and freedom, and not be subject to any acts of violence. Lone Wolf v. Hitchcock is another case I looked at. Breaking the treaties, taking the land against the will of the Indians, and this plenary power doctrine without any judicial review, a very troubling uh, state of affairs for a democracy. <clears throat> but that would have come out in a different way had, had this declaration been in place. Article 37, for example, I'm not sure I wrote that right, but. 
think that's Article 37 on the treaty, says that nations got to recognize and enforce their treaties with indigenous peoples. That would have put Lone Wolf to bed right there. Secondly, as far as taking land or reservation land against the will of the Indians, uh, Article 8B um, prohibits any acts that dispossess Indians, so Congress couldn't simply take the land. Plenary power without judicial review, which was another hallmark of uh, a lone wolf, uh, would be uh, prohibited by Articles 18 and 19, uh, which uh, provide uh, Native peoples with the right to participate in legislation that affects them and to be consulted. And so I think that puts a, uh, a circumscribes this plenary power, which is absolute power over Native people. I also looked at the uh, Sandoval case and a couple of the uh, guardianship cases that illustrate the dark side of guardianship when how Native people fared as wards of the nation in the period of 1883 to 1934 when the government's uh, guardianship powers over Native people were at their zenith uh, when two concepts of tutelage, uh, 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 wardship, civilization, you know, were and, and this uh, at their peak, you know, and the, the government promulgated, or the Secretary of Interior promulgated this code of Indian offenses that regulated our dress, our appearance, our marital customs, banned our religions, and uh, regulated uh, our life from the cradle board to the grave in a Orwellian uh, dystopia, kind of a frightening brave new world kind of a situation. Um, <coughs> That would have never occurred, those cases would never have occurred uh, had, had uh, Articles 3 and 4 of this declaration been in place. Regarding self-determination and self-government, which is at the core of this document, this code of Indian offenses um, that, that uh, banned our religions and, and uh, taking our kids to uh, the boarding schools to basically brainwash them away from their culture would, would, wouldn't have occurred either because Article 8, uh, subsection 1 says there's no forcible assimilation, prohibits the forcible assimilation of native peoples or the destruction of their culture. And this was the policy of the government for several generations that would be illegal under this uh, standard. Our pre-ICWA cases, I looked at the pre-Indian Child Welfare Act cases, and that those cases would never have allowed uh, our kids to be uh, uh, taken from their homes, Article 7 and 8. Uh, you can't forcibly re remove the kids you know, from, from the tribes and to another group, nor could you deprive an indigenous person of his or her cultural values or ethnic identity. I looked at the NAGPRA cases, the pre-NAGPRA cases, um, which would have come out differently in the article tw of, under Article 12, which accords the right of repatriation to indigenous peoples. On religion, I looked at uh, the su Supreme Court case and the Smith case, a case that I went to the Supreme Court twice in, uh, would have come out differently, I would submit, under Article 11 and 12 pertaining to in, uh, religious freedom of indigenous peoples. The Lane case on the sacred sites, which ruled there's no principle under the First Amendment to protect native worship at holy, on holy ground that's owned by the government. Uh, that would have come out differently had Article 12 been in place that protects our uh, uh, religious sites. And finally, I looked at the idea or the problems in protecting indigenous habitat. Uh, Looking somewhat at the uh, Tihatun case, um, even though it dealt with Aboriginal title, but the underlying dispute there was to protect this America's largest rainforest from uh, destruction by the Forest Service that wanted to convert uh, that magnificent rainforest into a uh, paper pulp uh, factory up there. <coughs> and, um, uh, and the Supreme Court in Tiatun saying the government can 
simply confiscate that area without needing to compensate the Clinket Indians. I think that would have come out differently had Articles 26 and 28 been in, in place to protect traditional lands and traditional land uses. And Article 29 would require the states to uh, uh, provide conservation and environmental protection of such lands, you know. And so uh, the Tiatun case and the related underlying problems on destroying a uh, indigenous habitat would have possibly be made a lot easier under that. So I think that I wouldn't have written this book if this declaration had been in place. Um, could have done other things with my life the <laughs> four years. Um, but it's a bellwether, this is a bellwether uh, uh, declaration. I, I think it affects all of us, uh, native and non-native people alike. I think it shows a uh, maturing uh, society, a maturing world after this uh, rapacious uh, 500 years of colonial history, you know, that has affected our much of our humanity and much of our legal and social and economic and education institutions. You know, finally, uh, at least here in the U.S., we have a maybe a maturing society, and I think that this uh, uh, declaration, you know, if implemented, you know, is really going to uh, put a cap on that and let us uh, rectify and, and, and remedy and uh, allow Native people to live with uh, dignity and, and uh, uh, be secure in our rights as Native people, our religious and political and human cultural rights as Native people to be secure in that and, and have, I think, a much better society uh, for that. So. Again, I want to thank um, Tim Coulter and uh, Julian Berger and uh, James Anaya and all of your colleagues, you know, for working on this. And I think that this is going to go down in history, I think, is my prediction, you know, as, as a very important piece of work. So I commend you and salute you. Thank you all for this.